start in Acts chapter 7 today. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 16. That is where we're going to be talking today. And if you will, I want you to go back and make a bookmark in Genesis chapter 11, the end of the chapter. That's where we're going to kind of tie this thing up today. You know, as I've, as I've been diving into this book so far, there are... Uh, The person who has stood out most to me that inspires me the most is Stephen. And that is the first, that's the guy we're going to be talking about today, is because Stephen was elected to be a deacon of the church. And the thing that was most amazing about Stephen is he was perfectly content being where he was. Like God called him to feed the widows, to feed the people that are less fortunate, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And he was perfectly fine with that, but Stephen had a burning desire in his heart because he knew that he wanted to preach the gospel. And so when they seize him and then bring him in front of the Sanhedrin, he takes a route that they never ever saw coming because everything that they were seeing through the eyes of the law, what, what Stephen's about to do is he's about to show them I'm about to take you on a road trip from the beginning all the way to the answer, who was Jesus Christ. So the title of today is going to be The Only Vision That You Need. Now the reason I say that is how often is it that we do ask God, what is our purpose? Like, what's my purpose? Like, It's like, God, I know you have me here. But I just don't really know what it is right now. So what is my purpose? What do you have for my life? Or we can even take it a step further. We can say that even when we do know what our purpose is, we know where God has called us, the area that he wants us to make an impact for the kingdom. And then you ask this question. You say, how are you going to use all these certain things that I'm walking through right now to be a part of it? So let's start in the scriptures with Abraham. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me, the God of glory, appeared to our father Abraham before he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. So where he's starting at, he is starting where God called Abraham. He was because if you go back to Genesis chapter twelve, you see when God called him. He said, Go from your country and from your land and go to the land that I will show you. And this is where Stephen starts at. He says, Guys, I'm gonna start right here, where where it all began, where he called him and where the particular area that he was calling him in. Verse 3, and he said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. The end of the verse, in the land that which you are now living, this is all taking place in Jerusalem, in the land of Canaan. Okay, so he's telling him, he's, he's telling you where he started, and then he's telling you where he's at right now. It's like God took him from where he's at, and now he's brought you right, right to where, where you are right now, where the 12 patriarchs started in the city of Jerusalem. But see, the thing about it is, Stephen doesn't tell you about what happened in between right here in these two scriptures. He just shows you where it started and where it's at right now. But don't worry, we're going to get to the middle here in a little bit. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised. Everybody say, but promised. <laughs> to give it to him as a possession and his offspring after him, though he had no child. If you go back to Hebrews 11, Abraham is what we're in, we consider the hall of faith. And what we consider the hall of faith is all these guys that God had called and they died in faith. They never received anything that God had shown them, but they still stayed the course. They didn't see in this life what God had planned for them, but they are seeing it right now. And what, he tell, is what he's saying right here with Abraham is Abraham never saw anything of the descendants that came after him. But the one thing he did, he knew that God had promised it to him. All right here, let's go from here. Verse 6, And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring 
would be sojourners in a land belonging to others. Now, the word sojourners is really a fancy word for saying strangers. Somebody that doesn't know where they're at. That's another fancy word for that. Who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. He's referring to when the children of Israel right here. He's talking about when they were enslaved in Egypt. He told them, this is what's going to happen. Your people are going to be enslaved. They're going to be enslaved in a, in a nation where they won't know where they're at. They won't know any of this. But I will take them out of that, and I will bring them into this place right now to worship me. Once again, God said what was going to happen, and he said what was going to happen after, but he didn't tell them what was going to happen in between. Because there's often times in our life where... God will tell us what he's going to do, but he's going to leave the experience up to us. And the reason the experience is up to us is because if God was to tell you what was going to happen while where he called you, there would be no reason to have any faith in him. That's good. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, it's like all right, uh, let's take Francis. All right. Like, say you're just praying, like, you're praying for the one, you're praying for that person or whatnot. If God was to come down and tell you, don't worry about it, you'll be married when you're 26, well, then I'm good. I'll just hang out with myself until I'm 26. I mean, when is it going to be? Is it going to be September of 2020? Like, I know when it's going to be. There would be no reason to trust in God and expect Him to make provision for you during the path. Do you know what I'm saying? If God was to tell you every single aspect of what would happen in your life, you would have no reason to lean into Him. So let's continue. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and the twelve patriarchs. Let's continue. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. Everybody read this with me. But God was with him. Amen. And rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all of his household. Now, when I, when I first dove into this verse, it was, I see what he did with Joseph. Like, even though Joseph was sold into Egypt and he went through all the things that, that he went through, God eventually took him out and gave him favor over Pharaoh and anything. But the coolest thing that makes me think about this is this kind of sounds like what Judas Iscariot did to Jesus. Like, Ju like Judas sold Jesus to the Pharisees. But God was with him. God was with him. The, the reason this has so much effect on me is because it makes me think about the midst of any kind of problem that we walk through. Like... It's like, God, I don't, I don't understand really what you're trying to do here, and it makes no sense to me right now, but I can rest in the fact that you're with me. There's a certain level of peace that God will bring into your life if you just completely depend on Him. Not anything that's happening around you. Because if we look to what is seen, nothing's going to make any sense. Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We rest in the fact that we don't make, that what's happening doesn't make sense. We rest in the fact that we look to what is unseen, the promise that God has for us. Amen. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan. And great affliction in our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt... He sent out our fathers on their first visit. Verse 13. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all of his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died. He and our fathers. To me, this is another great example of faith. Because when Jacob, the descendants after Abraham, while they were going through all the things that they went through, there came a famine, there was no food, they couldn't find anything, but eventually God brought them into some grain. Which to me is a symbol of His promise. It's like what happens in the middle doesn't really need to make a whole lot of sense because all I can do is rest in the fact that God's going to push me to where I need to be. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say that? 
The reason I got this highlighted right here, and he died, he and our fathers. Okay. I need you guys to stay with me on this because this next verse is so crucial. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. All right, you remember when I asked you to go back to Genesis chapter 11, right there? Let's go there in our Bibles real quick. The coolest part of this scripture is the whole example of how Stephen used Abraham because right here in the end of Genesis chapter 11, you see Abraham's father, Terah. Okay. Genesis chapter 11, 27 to 32. Starting in verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred, in the, in the Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay. It says right here that Terah had three sons, Abraham, well, at the time it was Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. But this is where it starts to get cool because, see, Terah was on a journey for God himself. Okay, because because he had a family. They were on this path. They were trying to get to a certain place that God had called them to. And his son, Haran, died in the presence of Abraham. A lot of people will tell you that it caused Haran so much grief and so much and so much suffering and pain that it eventually led to his death. But this is where we're getting to that here. And Abraham took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife, Malka. I'm, I'm, about like, I'm about like Scott when it comes to those names. I don't know how to pronounce anything. The daughter of Haran, the father of Malka, and Iscah. Now Sarah was barren. She had no child. This was before that Abraham said that she was going to have a son, Isaac, which would be the beginning of the descendants after him. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they had settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, while they're on this journey, they eventually arrive to a city that is the exact same name as you can see of Abraham's, of Abraham's third son, Haran. And, and what I believe is saying through this is Terah gets, eventually gets to a point that all of us get to on our journey. We get to this journey where everything is painful, everything, the weight on top of us is really, really bad, and to make matters worse, the name of the city is after his son that he had watched die. And it says right here, the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Okay, we're about to go on a little trip together. You got to check this out. The very next scripture begins Genesis chapter 12. That is whenever God called, called Abraham. Because Abraham spoke over his life, he said, Go into the land that I will show you. So Abraham begins his journey, and it goes on, and eventually you arrive in Genesis chapter 23, is when Sarah dies. And it was in that moment that Abraham wept. It even says in the scripture, he weeps over Sarah's death. And this is the coolest part to me. Abraham had no idea where he was at. He knew the name of the place, but he didn't know the significance of the place where he was at. He buries Sarah that a tomb that he buys for a sum of silver in the land of Canaan, in Shechem. Shechem in Jerusalem is where the 12 patriarchs started. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Abraham had no idea where he was at, but he knew that the descendants after him would be in a certain place. The descendants started in Shechem. 
in the midst of every bit of Abraham's pain, in the midst of every bit of Terah's pain, there was one thing that was crucial, and that was settling there. Because I don't, I don't care, I don't care like who you are or what you walk through in life. There's going to be a point. There's going to be a part on your journey, especially in your, if you're in the path of obedience, that the weight of people, the weight of life, the weight of everything will be on you at one point. But not once in God's word does He ever tell you to settle in the midst of your pain. That's good. The difference between Terah and Abraham is Terah settled in the greatest moment of his pain. When Abraham was in the greatest bit of his pain, he bought a tomb and he buried Sarah and he continued on to go. And then it goes on in Genesis whenever he died. Now, the coolest thing about this, this passage is it makes me think about this. Is You fast forward close to a thousand years later whenever a man named Jesus Christ came to the planet he did three years of his public ministry. He spent 30 years just working a common job as a carpenter, just an ordinary guy. He does three years of his public ministry, feeds the 5,000, makes the blind man see, heals the lame. And then he goes to the Last Supper, has some of the greatest tastings he ever did. And then he goes to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was in that moment that whenever Jesus is on his face and praying that the weight of every bit of the world, everything was on him at one time. And that's whenever he cried out, Father, if it is possible, let's just do this another way. But he didn't settle there. He still continued on to do what his purpose was. Absolutely. The biggest thing that I want to encourage all of us today is... Even though you're in the midst of your pain, you're still in the middle of God's promise. God's promise has not wavered one bit on your life. God's promise, God's word that he spoke over your life will never change. And the biggest thing that I want to get to you today is the only vision that you need is the word that was spoken over your life. That's right. That is the only thing that you need. So how do you do that? Like, I mean, okay, I know, like, I have faith in God. This is how you do it. You allow your faith to touch the glorious grace of God. Because if you can do that, then nothing in this life will ever, ever seem impossible. Do not settle in your pain. Your pain pushes you into your promise. Don't settle in your pain. Pain pushes you into your promise. Okay. Have you guys, have you ever heard of a story called Hind's Feet on High Places? Okay. Let me give you an example of this. The whole story about this is about uh, a girl called Much Afraid. That's her name. It's an allegory. Her name is Much Afraid, and she lives in a place called the Valley of Humiliation. And there's this group of people that are always coming to her house. They're called the fearings, bitterness, self-pity, all these other people. But she constantly sees this shepherd, like, walking by her house. He's always singing songs or whatnot. And she, she goes out there to talk to him because he's an outlet for her. And um, eventually one day, you know, she just has it with every bit of the fearings. She's tired of it. So eventually she goes out there, and there's this place that's far away. It's this mountain. It's called, it's called the kingdom of love. That's what the shepherd tells her. And she says, well, I want to go there. I'm tired of living in this valley. I want to go to this place. And he says, well, you can go to that place, but divine love has to be growing in your heart for you to be able to go there. So she says, well, I want to have this divine love. So she, she, she lifts up her arms, and she allows the shepherd to plant the seed of love in her, in her heart. And he says, now, okay, love is in your heart. The next time that I pass by your house, I want you to be ready to go. So she's sitting in her house. The fearings come back. They're pressuring her. They're saying all these things to her and everything. Well, she hears the shepherd singing, walking by her house. But she stays right there. And eventually the shepherd just passes by the house. And in that moment, she experiences so much. She feels so bad. She feels like she's, 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 she hasn't listened to the shepherd. She's, she's afraid that he's not going to take her now because he's walked by and she, she's avoided him. 
But when she walks out the door, she goes around and the shepherd's right there waiting for her. So she begins this journey. She goes out there and the shepherd says, are you ready? They're ready. And they, they're walking together, they're holding hands and all this stuff, everything seems happy, but they get to this point where these, there's these two people standing there waiting on her. And she says, well, who are these people? And she says, their names are sorrow and suffering. She says, that sounds terrible. He says, but this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to grab hands with these two companions. He said, I want you to go this journey. I've carved out this journey for you. Don't worry about what it looks like. I know what I'm trying to do with you going on this journey that you're on. And the whole time, it doesn't make sense to her why the names of the people that are with her are sorrow and suffering. But eventually, she gets to this place. She gets to the kingdom. And then she turns around, and those two people that were with her did not look the same as they were the journey they were on. She turns around, and she can see their face. They're beautiful. And she said, who are these people? She says, he said, I told you to walk hand in hand with sorrow and suffering because I've turned it into joy and peace. Amen. Amen. The thing about life that you cannot shake whatsoever is sorrow and suffering. Not once in the scriptures does God ever tell you that's not going to happen to you. But what he does tell you is that one day it will be turned into joy and peace. My biggest encouragement for you today is don't... When the world tells you to run away from sorrow and suffering, I'm telling you to lock arms with them. Because if you lock arms with sorrow and suffering and you go on this path that God has you on, it will not disappoint because we can rest in the fact that one day it will be turned into joy and peace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you love us in spite of us. Father, I just thank you that sometimes you just look down at us and you just, you just laugh because you know that you have a plan, you have a purpose. You just want us to rest in you. So, Father, it's my prayer today that as we leave this church, Father, that we would, well, as we leave this building, that we would be the church. Father, that we, that we would be the hands and feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we would tell everybody about just how awesome He is and show him, them a glimpse of the love that you showed us. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Guys, grace and peace to every single one of you today. I hope you have an amazing rest of the day. And we really look forward to seeing you in the future, Lord willing. God bless.